The year is 1350 BC, and a man is making his way toward the walls of Shechem. He's a farmer, a simple man who prefers the solidarity of the foothills of Mount Ebal over the noisy, smelly life of the city. He has come here today to sell a wagon load of wool at the market. From the prophets, he will be able to buy some new bronze tools. His old ones have become dull from years of shearing sheep and cutting rope some new softened leather for clothing, several pounds of salt, and perhaps, if there was some spare change, a small scrap of Torah written on a fragment of dried papyrus, which could be hung over the doorpost of his humble home in the country. As the man enters the city that used to be inhabited by Canaanites, the din of conversation, kids playing by the gate, and a watchman shouting a greeting from the wall meet his ears. He waves to the watchman and nods respectfully, to some of the elders who are seated by the gate. Upon entering, he's greeted by the biggest structure in the whole city, the temple. It's large stones and great pillars towering over the rest of the architecture. But it's empty. This Canaanite temple, left over from the people who previously inhabited the city of Shechem, would never serve any kind of function for its new Israelite occupants. The countryman shook his head at the stunningly huge religious pillar, the Masaba that came into view at the front of the temple. Someone would have to do something about this temple and its great pillar full of inscriptions proclaiming the presence and rule of the old Canaanite gods, he thought to himself. These were not built for the God of Israel. They were built for the gods of Canaan. Having this Canaanite temple at the center of a community that worshiped Yahweh was just wrong, even unnatural, he thought. After all, the gods of Canaan are not Lord here. Yahweh is. The gods of Canaan don't reside in the midst of this covenant community. Yahweh does. This temple, the man thought, would have to go. Well, I hope that different way of starting a sermon uh, this morning helped us kind of step into the world of the Bible, uh, which is what we're going to try to be doing um, throughout the sermon this morning. Um, we're going to be continuing our series called Common Threads, uh, where we are uh, exploring some major themes that are like golden threads that run through the whole storyline of the Bible. And today, we're going to be talking about the temple. Now, the temple is really hard to talk about because there's a whole bunch of other really important things that are all kind of integrated into the temple. You have kind of sacred holiness and sacred space uh, wrapped up in the temple. You have priesthood wrapped up in the temple, uh, kingship and land, they're all wrapped up in the temple. So uh, to help me talk about temple in a way that uh, is kind of focused and doesn't go for an hour, I'm going to be reading from a script for most of the sermon today, and you'll thank me when you're eating lunch at 12.30 and not 1.30. Um, you'll also notice there are some handouts and notes uh, around in the pews. Uh, my coworker Katie did a great job of putting those together. Um, if you're not a handout person, you don't need to use them. Um, everything that's on there, I'm gonna say from here. Uh, but if you are a note taker, if you do like to follow along, uh, that will make it nice and easy for you to do that. Um, and one thing I do wanna point out about those handouts is there are four QR codes on the last page um, if you're interested in further reading, um, there's a video in one of them, some more resources on this theme. There's some great additional resources at the end of the notes for you that you can scan with your camera. So today, we're really going to be trying to answer a few key questions. We're going to start off by asking, how did the ancient people who wrote the Bible understand a temple? What did it do? What did it mean? Why was it important? And what we're going to find is that the answer to this is really important for who Jesus was and what he accomplished, which in turn means it's really important for you and me. So we're going to dive in, and we're going to dive in with just a definition. And this definition is kind of loaded with, with a few different concepts, and then we're going to kind of unpeel the layers of this definition as we go. So we can think about a temple like this. A physical manifestation of the heavenly place in which God rules, rests, and resides 
usually signified by a mountain and representing the whole world. I'm gonna read that one more time because there's a lot. We can think of a temple as a physical manifestation of the heavenly place in which God rules, rests, and resides, usually signified by a mountain and representing the whole world. So we're gonna start with the mountain bit uh, because that's the, probably the part that feels most out of left field. And uh, we're gonna just explore the really important relationship between temples and mountains in the worldview of the Bible and uh, the other cultures uh, that were neighboring the people who wrote the Bible. So I'm gonna dive into my script and uh, we'll explore that together. In the worldview of the ancient people who lived around the Mediterranean Sea, a place in time referred to today as the ancient Near East, gods lived on what was called cosmic mountains or world mountains, and they ruled from these mountains. Mountains were high, awe-inspiring, inaccessible environments, the perfect place for a deity to dwell. Opposite to how we as Westerners often think about mountains, in the desert environments of the Middle East, mountains receive more dew and moisture than the parched ground far below and are some of the most lush and green landscapes in the area. This vegetation was seen as the fertility and the blessing and a sign of the presence of the gods. Temples were often built around or on the base of these mountains and were functionally equivalent to the mountains as places on which the deity ruled, rested, and where he dwelled. Uh, just a couple examples from, from the neighbors of Israel. Uh, in the civilization of Ugarit, uh, which they're right next door to the nation of Israel, uh, their chief god El, he had temples, but he was seen as ruling from his mountain. Uh, we all know from the Old Testament, uh, the Canaanite god Baal, or Baal, he had temples, but he ruled from Mount Bashan, which you can also read about in the Old Testament. The Egyptians saw their temples as being built on the original mountains that first rose out of the waters of creation. Even Zeus, in much later Greek mythology, he lived on Mount Olympus. This is a very, very widespread understanding of the world. And the Old Testament shares in this. The Old Testament describes the God of Israel as dwelling on a mountain. And this doesn't start, as we might think, with Mount Sinai or even Mount Zion. This starts all the way back in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, the, the most clear place where we can see this is from the prophet Ezekiel. He's reflecting on uh, Genesis 1 and 2, and in chapter 28, verses 13 through 14, he's reflecting on Genesis 2, and he calls Eden the holy mountain of God. See, for Ezekiel, Yahweh's presence in the garden, like it's described in Genesis 2, meant that it had to be the mountain dwelling of God. Similarly, as I just mentioned, the, the tabernacle, it originated at Mount Sinai, which is referred to all throughout the book of Exodus as the mountain of God. The tabernacle, in turn, became a miniature version of this mountain dwelling of God and continued to create the conditions in which God first revealed himself. If you recall back to the Exodus story, uh, God revealed himself in kind of the storm. There's lightning flashes, there's clouds and thunder. Well, you enter into the tabernacle and you have clouds, but they're made of incense. You have flashes of light, but it comes from the flickering of the, the candles. And it's the same kind of dark, smoky, meant to emulate a storm a kind of environment that was originally on the mountain of God. For this reason and others that we don't have time for, uh, Old Testament scholar Michael Morales, reflecting on these ideas, says, the tabernacle became the portable mountain of God. So now we're starting to see this relationship between mountains and temples emerge. Finally, the temple in Jerusalem was founded on Mount Zion, and one of my favorite things is that if you go there to Israel, Zion is not a mountain, not even close. It's like a little hill. But all throughout the Old Testament, it's described as the largest mountain in the whole world. Isn't that funny? Not because it's really tall, but because that's where God dwelt. So theologically, it was the mountain, even though it wasn't physically. So to quote Morales one more time, Temples were poetically conceived of 
as world mountains, cosmic mountains, mountains on which the God ruled, rested, and reigned. So if the heavenly mountain was the place from which the God ruled, to enter the temple was to step onto the mountain, into the heavens, to the place where heaven meets earth. Thus from there, as well as from the mountain, the God ruled, rested, and resided. So that's this relationship between mountains and temples. So as we've just seen, temples were not simply symbolic of the presence of the deity. It's not that the temple just kind of stood for or represented this heavenly mountain dwelling. Instead, entering into the temple was seen as actually entering into the heavenly mountain dwelling. Uh, N.T. Wright says, When you went up to the temple, it was not as though you were in heaven. You were actually there. That was the point. This is seen throughout the Old Testament, but is especially clear in several of the Psalms, where Yahweh is described as both in the temple and in the heavens at the exact same time. Uh, This is seen best in Psalm 11, verse 4, where the poet writes, get this, the Lord is in his temple, The Lord is on his heavenly throne. Just right back to back. Because they're both the same thing. It's not one in contradiction with the other. To be in the temple was to be on the heavenly mountain. And when you think about it, this makes sense of why the curtains of the tabernacle and the temple and the the Ark of the Covenants uh, in in the Holy of Holies, it's, it's all decked out with like cherubim, right? These like crazy looking winged creatures, right? Because to enter into the tabernacle or the temple was to enter into the heavens and be among heavenly beings. So now that we've discovered a little bit about the relationship between mountains and temples in the ancient Near East and how they function in the Old Testament, we can begin to look more specifically at creation, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and the important role that temples play in creation. And you might be thinking, Matthew, have you read Genesis 1 and 2? There's not a temple there. Just hang with me. In the stream of ancient Near Eastern creation accounts, so these other cultures, they're writing stories too. They have ideas about how the world came into being and how how it was created by, by their false god that they worship. The typical way that it went, the typical kind of story, went that the god creates, orders the cosmos, kind of puts everything in place, and then builds a temple to rest in. The best example from this is uh, in the Babylonian creation story, which is called the Enuma Elish. Uh, Their god named Marduk, he creates and orders the cosmos, he's made king, all this good stuff. And at this occasion, here's what Marduk says. He says, below the firmament, whose grounding I have made firm, a house I shall build. Let it be the abode of my pleasure. Within it I will establish its holy place, I shall appoint my chambers. I will establish my kingship. So in this, temp- in this text, the temple functions in three really important ways that we've actually already alluded to a couple of times. First, this temple is a place of kingship. He's, Marduk is quoted as saying, quote, I will establish my kingship. He rules from the temple. Second, it is a place for which, for, in which Marduk rests after he finishes creating. He says, it will be the abode of my pleasure. And thirdly, it is the place where his personal presence resides. He says, I will appoint my holy chambers. He's living there. He's living there, he's resting there, and he rules from there. And as we'll see in the next few minutes, these three things, rule, rest, and personal residence, are the three great functions of temples as these ancient people understood them. Now, Genesis 1 contrasts the norm in some really, really important ways. And Genesis ends up making some totally different statements about their God and what they believed about him. See, because like we said earlier, in Genesis 1 and 2, Yahweh doesn't build a temple when he finishes creating, does he? He sets up something else. He sets up a holy time, which we refer to as the Sabbath. There are multiple reasons why this is really important, uh, but the big one is that because the God of the Bible, in contrast with how Israel's neighbors viewed their gods, 
He doesn't need a temple to rest in. Why? Because the whole cosmos, all of creation is his resting place. All of creation is his temple. This is seen most clearly in Isaiah 66, one and two, uh, where Yahweh, he's kind of asking some rhetorical questions. He says, heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you would build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being. So just like in the Babylonian text about Marduk that we discussed, Yahweh also has a place of kingship. But it's not this brick and mortar temple. He says, heaven is my throne. Like Marduk, Yahweh also has a place of rest. But he says, earth is my footstool. Not this little spot. He says, I I kick back and put my legs up on the earth. That's the image. And a place, he also has a place where his personal residence resides, but it's all of the heavens and the earth, not a brick and mortar temple. So you see the different statements that Israel and the early chapters of Genesis are making about God. So when Yahweh sets aside a holy time, instead of a holy place in which to rest, Genesis 1 and 2, they're critiquing their neighbors and the way that they saw their gods. And they're saying that for our God, all of creation, the whole cosmos, the heavens and the earth, that's our God's temple, not this little building. His rule is everywhere. He doesn't need a certain central place to to rest or rejuvenate. He doesn't need to rest. In his personal presence, it, it radiates through all of creation. Now, later Israelite thinkers like, like Isaiah, they're reflecting on Genesis 1 and 2 and they're formulating all this and they clarify it all and they just put this little statement in here of God putting his, putting his feet up on the earth and ruling from the heavens and that's just a, a, a reflection of uh, Genesis 1 and 2. So from Genesis 1, Isaiah 66 and other passages like them, we can see that all of creation is Yahweh's temple. Nevertheless, in an effort to restore a relationship with humanity that had become estranged from him, Yahweh does eventually live among a people in a tabernacle and later in a temple. This is, of course, among the people of Israel. But here's the remarkable thing. The construction, or we might say the creation of the tabernacle and temple, it's actually modeled after the creation of the cosmos in Genesis 1 and 2. And they're therefore meant to be seen as taking on the same sort of cosmic significance as the original creation in Genesis 1 and 2. So I had originally put together uh, a list in my own words of all the ways that the the authors of the Bible had kind of linked the tabernacle and the temple uh, to the creation of the cosmos. And then I found this quote by a scholar that had all the same things, said it better, and in about half the words that I had said it. Uh, So we're just going to read him instead. Uh, Gordon Wenham wrote this. Many of Eden's features anticipate the design of the tabernacle and the temple in Jerusalem. For example, both Eden and the tabernacle and temple had their entrances facing toward the east. The cherubim, which are traditional guardians of holy places in the ancient Near East, are placed at the entrance of Eden in Genesis 3, and they're also found decorating the tabernacle and the temple. Gold and rare stones which were a part of the decorations of the tabernacle and temple sanctuaries and the high priest garments were also found in Eden. The seven branch candlestick, or menorah is the Hebrew word, is decorated in tree-like terms and corresponds to the tree of life in the garden. We can get even more specific. The same verb to walk, which is used to describe God's presence in Eden, is used to describe his presence in the tabernacle and the temple. And finally, Adam is put in the garden to work and keep it in Genesis 2, which is a combination of verbs also used to describe the Levites in the tabernacle and the temple. And to this list, we can add even a couple more things. Uh, When Yahweh is first describing to Moses, here's how you're going to make the tabernacle. He does it in seven acts of speech, followed by a command to keep the Sabbath. That sound a little bit like Genesis 1? does. Similarly, the temple construction is described as taking seven years. The construction of both mirror the construction of the cosmos in Genesis 1. 
And finally, has it ever stood out or seemed weird to you that when you read descriptions of the tabernacle and the temple, it's like, why are these things full of fruit and tree decorations? Does that ever seem weird? That's because it's meant to recall the garden and the abundance of the original creation, Yahweh's cosmic temple. So, the tabernacle and temple, modeled after Yahweh's original good creation of Genesis 1 and 2, they serve as a miniature new cosmic temple. It's not the whole thing right now. It's, it's centered on this little structure as Yahweh is, is working on this rescue and redemption plan for his creation. The corruption of humanity and Yahweh's original creation, which is highlighted in the early stories of Genesis and highlighted by the Egyptian empire in Exodus, they've met their match in this little tent of the tabernacle. Here, Yahweh's rule, rest, and personal residence, these three primary functions of the temple, they're restored, but in miniature. Here, his presence is with humanity in a way that had been lost to the rest of the world because of sin. Furthermore, this structure reminded Israel that in a true Genesis 1 fashion, the whole cosmos was meant to be a place of Yahweh's rule, rest, and residence. The tabernacle and temple prophetically held out an ideal that claimed that all is right only when Yahweh's rule, rest, and residence are at home in every corner of, the, of creation. It is in this sense that the tabernacle and the temple are cosmically significant. They're making statements about the whole of creation, about all of the world. Uh, N.T. Wright helps us out here. He says, the temple was a miniature version of the whole creation. It's another part of the definition we originally read. And this temple, it proclaims a better future reality of Yahweh's rule, rest, and residence over a creation that had fallen away from the realities it was designed for. Now, we're going to uh, look at one really quick line um, that really pulls all this together. Um, and it's from an ancient Israelite commentary on Genesis. So uh, the people of Israel, they wrote a lot of things that aren't in the Bible. And a lot of it was stuff that's like thinking about, explaining, interpreting the Bible. Um, one of those writings that's focused on Genesis is called Jubilees. Uh, and in Jubilees chapter 8, as they're just thinking about Genesis, thinking about these things, uh, they're talking about the Garden of Eden. And here's how they're thinking about the Garden of Eden. Here's what he says. The Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies. And you're like, what is the Holy of Holies? Like, I thought the Holy of Holies was in the tabernacle in the temple. But they'd say, exactly. Because the Garden of Eden is like this little hot spot center of Yahweh's presence in the temple of creation. You see that? So the Garden of Eden is the Holy of Holies and the dwelling of the Lord. And then it says, and Mount Sinai and Mount Zion. It just links them all together and goes, Shh. these are all doing the same thing. They're all facilitating God's rule, his rest, and his presence. So for these ancient Jewish readers of Genesis, the Garden of Genesis 2 was like the Holy of Holies of the cosmic temple, the place where Yahweh's presence was most manifest in creation, just as the center of the tabernacle in Sinai and later the temple on Zion would be. So this is all really important and, and well and good, but the history of Israel begs one really key question, and we got to talk about that, and that is the question of exile when Israel gets taken away to Babylon. And this is the kind of questions that this prompts. If Yahweh's personal presence is in this temple, this is where he rules from, this is where he rests. What happens when people from another land who serve other gods come and destroy it? What does that do to your worldview? What does that do to how you understand God? Has, has Yahweh just been defeated by the Babylonian gods? Is he not as strong as them? What happened? Has, has, has Yahweh left us? N.T. Wright says something along the lines of, uh, of this when, when he's talking about this exact thing. He says, their worldview would have threatened 
to break apart. How do you understand that? And furthermore, even when decades later they start to return from Babylon, they come back to their land, they start to rebuild their temple, it never really compares to the glory of, of the previous temple. And they're still under the rule of Persia, and then Greece, and then Rome, and the glorious presence of Yahweh didn't return to dwell in the temple as it previously had. So most of Israel, they continued to think, speak, and write as if the exile was continued, even after some of them had come back to the land. And the all-important question they asked was, can Yahweh really rule? If Persia, Greece, and Rome rule his people. And that is the world that Jesus stepped into in the first century under Roman occupation with Israel seeing itself primarily as still in exile, under occupation, waiting for redemption, waiting for God to show up, reestablish their, their kingship and bring freedom. And the Gospel of John is actually especially interested in, in these exact themes. And we're gonna pick up in chapter four, uh, verses 20 through 24. We're gonna pick up in a conversation Jesus is having with a Samaritan woman and uh, the Israelites and the Samaritans, they didn't like each other very much. They had some really significant rivalries, kind of some animosity, and that's gonna show up here. Um, so starting in verse 20, the woman says to Jesus, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. So they're having a debate about which temple and which mountain is the right one. Now, We've gotten far enough that we know now how significant that debate was. It was, which one of us is truly his people? Which one of us truly has Yahweh and his personal presence and his rule coming from our land, from our people, right? So important, crucial to how they saw themselves and understood themselves. And Jesus seems to almost dismiss it, doesn't he? He like doesn't even really address the problem and, and says something else instead. Doesn't that seem... Weird. It would have seemed weird to the woman. But John has already kind of set us up to kind of get a sense of what's going on here. If we rewind two chapters back to John 2, Jesus makes one all-important claim. He claimed to be the temple. He claimed to be the temple. Meaning that everything that we've discussed, everything the temple did, everything it functioned as, facilitating the rule, rest, the personal presence of God, the place where heaven and earth overlap and meet, Jesus complained to, uh, proclaimed that he was that. That he was that. Here's what he says. So the Jews say to him, after he's just driven out the money changers, people selling livestock, they ask him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And they replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? And then John, the author of the gospel, he kind of butts in and he gives us a little note. He's like, the temple that he spoke of was actually his body, it's not the building. He's like giving us a little hint, he's letting us know what Jesus is talking about, what he's actually getting at. So we gotta let that sink in. Jesus proclaimed to be the temple. So the idea of the temple, it wasn't that Jesus made it irrelevant. It's not that he came up and said, oh, you, you silly people, you've been you know, doing this temple thing and for so long that, that was, that's outdated now. No, he became it. He incarnated the temple. He embodied it. Now the person of Jesus was where God's rule was made manifest, where his presence rested, where he resided. 
As the temple, Jesus mediated God's presence to creation. As the temple, Jesus provided a way and a setting through his death and resurrection in which people could have rest with God and God could have rest with people. As the temple, Jesus facilitated the kingship and the rule of God. He talked about it all the time. We talk about it all the time. The kingdom of God, right? As the temple, Jesus gives access to the heavenly dwelling of God. And finally, in his death and resurrection, new creation began with the final trajectory of making all things new. And that's still what we are hoping for and waiting for. And that's what we experience when we are joined with Jesus, when we're filled with the Spirit and baptized into him. But Jesus is not currently on earth as a temple, right? He, he ascended to the right hand of the Father, but his Spirit was given to his followers, to the church, to us. And then the New Testament authors start to do something really interesting. They start to take all those functions of the temple from the Old Testament and how Jesus functioned as a temple, and they start to apply that stuff to the church. To the church. So again, we need to let this sink in. You and me, we now function as the throne of God from which he rules over his creation. We now function as the place in which his presence rests and where he resides. We function as the place where heaven and earth come together in new creation. That's you and me now because we are temples and together are a temple. Paul talks about this a lot. If we pick up in Ephesians 2, He says this, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. Notice all the architectural language in there. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So Paul's looking at, here's what we've always understood a temple to be. You're now doing that. You are now the place in which God resides. But it's more than just where God's presence is and where he resides. We're also what reflects God's rule and where his rule is of earth comes out from. First Corinthians chapter six, Paul's dealing with some immorality in the Corinthian church. And he's trying to get through to them like, the way that you're living is incompatible with who you're following, right? Um, and he picks up in, in first Corinthians chapter six, we we'll start in verse 19. He says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. So it's not just about having God's presence, it's that you also must reflect his kingship and his authority and his will in your own actions and to the world. And finally, as a temple, the people of God prophetically declare that the whole cosmos was made for his rule, his rest, and his presence, just like the tabernacle and temple did, like we talked about earlier. That's what we hope for a new creation, Right? Like we see ourselves as little pockets of new creation. The old man has passed away. The new man has come, right? We're made new. And we're waiting for that to happen to all of creation. And we, as little as a a church, outpost of new creation, we're saying this is the trajectory of the whole cosmos, the new heavens and the new earth, right? Or as Paul says, talking about these things in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, God will be all in all. And all this is starting to sound eerily similar to the early chapters of Genesis again. In particular, as we come to the end of our theme in in the, the story of the Bible, in Revelation 21, verse 22, here's what John describes as he sees a vision of, of the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, the new earth. He says this, I didn't see a temple 
in the city. Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. I didn't see a temple in this city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So we don't need a tabernacle anymore. We don't need a temple anymore. We don't need a, a brick and mortar structure from which God's rule, his rest, and his presence flows out from. We don't even need the church primarily for that anymore. Why? Because God's personal presence is there itself. It doesn't need to be mediated through something else. The cosmos, once again, has become the temple. Because it was made, creation was made for his presence, for his rule, for his residence. And this causes me to stop and reflect and ask some questions. Because if I am this, and you are this, if this is what we are, we're temples of God, and this is what we're made to do, to function as a temple that mediates his rule and his rest and his presence. Do we do that? I know sometimes I do. Sometimes I definitely don't. You know, when an annoyed word becomes a mean or a passive aggressive comment, I'm not doing that. I'm not reflecting the, the rule and rest and presence of God, when I'm out in public and I, I maybe don't give somebody in, in the checkout line or whatever the attention and intentionality and care and acknowledgement that they deserve, I kind of just blow them off. That is not doing that very well. But what I find helpful is that thinking of yourself as a temple and kind of understanding, oh, this is how the biblical authors thought about it. This is what it meant. It kind of gives you a framework, doesn't it? To think about and assess, where am I at? How am I doing with this? Am I reflecting God's rule in the choices I make in my personal life and then in how I interact with people around me? Am I reflecting a life that is at peace and at rest with my creator? Am I living a life that is reflecting and, and communicating the fact that God's presence is in me? and flowing out of me. When you interact with other people, do they feel like, wow, there's something different about that person. What they're experiencing is a little bit of new creation, a little bit of heaven and earth coming together. So I want to invite us to just pray for that. And I think the Spirit will encourage us in the ways that we do that well in a lot of different ways. I know all of us do. But I know all of us also have areas that God would like to just bring to our attention and say, hey, I don't know if this is reflecting these things. I don't know if this is compatible with who you're made to be as a temple. So why don't you stand and just with open hearts, open minds, we're gonna invite the Spirit to speak And we're going to be available to whatever he wants to say. Let's pray together. We love you, Father. And we thank you that you have called us together in each of us individually to be the temple of your spirit, to be the place from which you rule your creation, the place in which you rest and come close to your creation and where your personal presence resides. God, what a privilege, what a gift. And we say we're sorry for the many times when we don't live in a way that is in alignment with that, where we don't make choices and treat other people in a way that is in alignment with that. But God, that's what we want to do. So by the power of your spirit, would you help us? Would you help us to do that? I invite you to speak, to lead us in our day-to-day, -day, every moment, to do that, to mediate your presence, so that other people would feel your love, your presence through us.
Help us to grow closer to you, to reflect you more, be conformed to your image. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.